Now we move on to system configuration where we just configure some aspects about the system. There's a description there about system V, uh, one way of managing the system startup. The other way, of course, is more than one system D. Uh, advantages there, well, it looks like it's naming fewer advantages and more disadvantages, so it probably indicates that system D, D is probably a better system. Um, although the fact that system V has stayed around for so long in tandem with system D probably indicates that some people don't agree with that. Um, so the, as I said at the beginning, the boot scripts are all uh, part of the book for perusal, um, but they've packaged them all up in a single package so that you can just install them but they're there in the book to read and maybe even modify to your own requirements so extract the package change into it and as usual just follow what's on the um, in the instructions on the screen that's it so I'll tidy them up now move on. So there's some information there about device and module handling. Um, originally devices used to be created statically. Um, as I remember the LFS book had a script that would generate um, some appropriate devices uh, but the modern way of doing it is to generate them on the fly so the, there's a tool UDEF that interrogates what hardware the system's got and just generates the appropriate devices as virtual devices effectively. Um, but as you saw, we created two console and null, which are, are required a boot time, so that's why they're the only static devices that are in the dev, and then effectively they get augmented when new dev runs. So let you read that in your own time. Managing network devices. Um, so we've got to run these scripts to create some initial rules for UDAV. And it says here to find out what name was assigned the network device. So you can see here this is the name for this particular machine. Yours will vary. It can look very similar, it can look quite a lot different. I've got one machine where it's ENO, um, most of them are ENP7S0, some might have another letter and number after it, it just depends on the topography of the hardware in in the system itself, how it's laid out, that's, that's how that name is generated. Um, another way you can do this by doing IPA, which shows your current network devices so you can see there it is again there ENPS0 and that's how I'm connecting um, so that's the network so we need to remember that ENP7S0 there's more information there about other devices um, if you've got a CD-ROM which are less common now than they ever used to be in fact the machine I just built is the first machine that I specifically didn't buy a CD-ROM or DVD drive for. Um, and the one before that, even then, which was 2013, I, I did buy a drive, but it didn't last in that last in the machine for very long. Um, so yeah, they're certainly uh, quite out of fashion now. Um, I probably probably because of USB devices. And there's some information there about duplicate devices. So, for example, we've got two video cards, two sound cards, two CD-ROMs even. So, we go on now to <coughs> configuring the network card. Now, by default, they use the ETH0 device, and that's the old way of naming devices. And the problem is that if you've got multiple network cards in the system, which is not an uncommon thing these days, um, ETH0 could point to 
either or any of the network devices in the system. Um, so I don't use that anymore because of that potential issue. I don't, I don't think I ever came across that problem on machines that had more than one network card, but it is a potential um, pitfall that, that could happen. So what I do is I do use the device that we've already seen, EMP7S0. And you might even notice some messages to the fact of, um, I can't remember which way around it is now, if you use the old naming or the new naming, it, you see a kernel message sometimes that scrolls up and saying that it's renamed the device. Um, so basically what we need to do is copy this, but instead of putting E0, I'm going to put in the name of the device. So you can either use this name here or this name here. It's obviously the same. It's referring to the same device. And then I'll copy the rest of this. So that's created a file called ipconfig emp7.emp7s0 on your system it will be different <clears throat> and now I'm going to edit that file to just tweak the settings a little bit further for my own network um, now what I'm going to do is reuse this IP address that the machine is using so I'm going to copy that before I edit it and this is the IP address of the machine so let me just go down these so on boot, on boot yes device E0 well it's not that now it's ENP7 S0 IPv4 static is the type of connection we're using and then the IP address I want to paste that in Gateway I need to change for my network it's zero one and likewise with the broadcast that needs to be changed to zero and that's should be all that needs to be changed. I'm just going to cat that file to the screen to just cross check the suffix EMP seven S zero that's the same sorry to cross check the um, device network device interface name mp7s0 that's the same as the suffix of the file so that's good and it matches up with the um, name that's currently in use as well etcresolve.conf so this is the file that translates um, naming uh, internet names to actual IP addresses so again I'll, I'll copy that what's in the book and then I'll go back and edit it manually to tune it so domain um, you can leave this blank I just use uh, my net.org because I've got that set up and then the name server I've got my own private name server so I'll use that. If you use this it won't work unless you know you've got a name server on this IP address. Alternatively you can search the internet for free uh, name servers or use one that's provided by your internet service provider uh, which you could probably find out from your router. Um, there's a selection here, so there's some free ones. So the first one we've got here is 11111, sorry, 1111 and 1001. And it's, it wouldn't be any harm in actually adding a second name server, so I'm going to do that by just specifying another name server line here and just paste in. Um, the IP address, and I could, in, you know, add another one and use their backup server, or indeed I could use um, another name server for another company in case um, that company's uh, name server goes down. So, for example, I could use the Google one here. So, if I copy the primary one here, so that that would be sufficient. 
So I'll save that. So basically what would happen if the first name server doesn't work, it times out or it's not responding, it will move on to the next one and so on. Next we need to specify a host name. So currently I've called this Strix just because I've named it after the motherboard. I didn't know what else to call it at the time. So I'll just keep that for now. And then there's the host file that needs to be created. And this is more detailed. Um, certainly about the host system, but you can also add in other hosts that maybe don't have a DNS entry um, and can only be accessed by an IP address. Um, with this file you can add in a name, an arbitrary name for that server and just refer to it as that name. You specify the name and the IP address. So I'm just going to modify it. So leave the first entry because it's um, it gives some translation to the current machine so this IP address refers to the, the machine we're on it's a loopback IP address and this is a fully qualified domain name for the local machine and the shorthand name for it as well so you leave that don't need to touch that this next IP address I've always a little bit doubtful about this when I've read about it it's apparently there for certain distributions that need it to operate in a certain way and from what I've read it's some people don't like the idea of it um, and it's certainly I've never found that I needed it so what I tend to do is just delete that line and then I just create the single entry for the machine I'm on um, press insert and I use the same IP address that I used before the fully qualified the name, domain name with FQDN well that's the name of the uh, computer I just used so that's the host name which is I just gave it strix dot the domain so it's mynet.org then I follow that with the shorthand name so strix and then I can also add in any other names that I'd like to call this server as well. So any other any other methods of accessing this server. Any other names, sorry. Um, I might want to have other aliases. I can add them in after that if I wish to. IPv6, I don't use that, but um, it looks like you don't need to specify um, host name for this machine for IP6 because I don't use IP6 I don't know virtually anything about it um, but I assume you just leave them as they are um, but as I don't use it so I'm going to just delete these lines and that's a sufficient uh, host file uh, can be nice sometimes to actually use tabs to format this a little bit to make it look a little bit neater just to make the columns a bit more obvious. So basically got the IP address, the fully qualified domain name and the host name. So I'll save that. So there's a bit of an explanation about the boot scripts and we need to create a default init tab file for the sysv init to use. And Effectively, this creates some virtual terminals for us to use, and it specifies default run levels and so on, and that they're all explained in here. Configuring the system clock, so I'll copy this script. Now, of course, we're using this on the USB, so normally you wouldn't be using static IP address on the USB stick. You'd um, have to go to the BLFS book and install DHCP so that um, when the USB stick booted it requested a free IP address so what I'm doing here for USB stick is not really the correct way of doing it but in terms of showing 
how to install LFS it's perfect, perfectly adequate and likewise with this file for setting the um, clock options uh, it depends on what machine what, what other operating systems you have on the machine so if you've got a Windows operating system the time is stored in local time in the BIOS whereas Linux assumes UTC time so again that would have um, an effect if you were to boot this USB on a Windows machine uh, the time would be offset um, assuming you set this to um, A1 which indicates that um, the time is stored in UTC in the BIOS So, what I'll do is just edit this file to check it, and you can see there's nothing there to actually change. I'm going to keep it as UTC1 because I've only got Linux on this machine. Um, but as I say, if, if you're to be installing this side by side with a Windows machine, or you, if you are following along with the USB stick. Um, and you know you're going to be using it mostly on Windows machines and you might want to change that to a zero. And this is the clock, clock params and UTC parameters may also be set in the etc sysconfig rc.site file which I think we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, there's a console script here for setting some parameters with the um, about the console which basically defines the um, what it mentions there what, what settings you can have in there, a key map you can load, logging level to set, um, a font and so on. So generally this what's in here is usually okay but you might want to modify it. I always do. Um, the bits that I change is first of all I put a log level entry in here otherwise you'll get spurious kernel entries appearing so log level equals 3 is a good value find the quotes so log level equals 3 that, that I think just issues uh, important kernel messages to the console otherwise you get messages randomly appearing in one of the consoles uh, the key map you'll need to change, I think it's currently set for Polish, yes, Polish keyboard setup. So I need to change that for a UK keyboard. So I'll change that to UK. And with the um, font, generally this font's fine for me, it's quite a nice font, but I need to change this 2 to a 1 because 8859 character set refers to Eastern Europe and the dash one refers to Western Europe so I'll just change that bit um, and there's some examples here for other countries as German, Keymap, Bulgarian and so on so there's a few examples there so I'll save that there's a bit there about configuring K syscalogd script Here's that RC site file that was mentioned. By default, there's nothing actually activated in it. It's all um, got a hash in front, so it's all remarked out. But if you find there's something in there that you might want to modify, then you can go in there and tweak that. Uh, customizing boot and shutdown scripts. There's some information there about that. bash shell startup files so we need to set the locale this shows us what we've got installed as you remember if you remember in glibc we installed all these to help aid better coverage of tests um, we need to pick one of these one I use is that, whoops, that one there engb so 88591 it's also useful to have a UTF-8 one as well 
And there's a command here, if I run this, substitute the locale name that I want to use. So, so I want to use this one. Put that in and press enter. It tells me um, the name of the file um, which I then have to append to the country, uh, the language and the country code as, as it says here. So um, as you saw it said ENGB but the ISO 88591 needs to be in capitals because that's what the output is. And as you can see you can rerun the same command with different operators to get more information about that locale map and what I'll do here is to copy that information into ETC profile so I'll copy part of that then I'll copy the ENGB part followed by the output and then copy the rest of this like that so you can see if I edit this you can see I've got the full export lang equals um, language en which, which is English GB the country code followed by the character set that I wish to use creating an ETC input file so I can just copy this and can be modified with further entries. ETC shells file, we need this to tell the system what the shells are that are installed. So we're telling it there's a default SH, which is like the original shell in Unix. And then we've also got bash, and if you remember bash is actually a, or SH is a sim link pointing at bash anyway, so if either of these are chosen, they'll always end up at bash.